today I'm going to take a look at a new game called Victory and Glory, the American Civil War. It's similar to a Napoleonic's game with a similar name. I think it was called Victory and Glory, Napoleonic Wars or something like that. The game was pretty good. It was okay. Actually, I should play it some for this channel because I really enjoyed it and I haven't played it in a long time, but had some problems. Um, I think at the end, I kind of stopped playing it because I'd figured out how to beat the AI. Um, this game, um, I'm not sure how good the replay value is going to be because it's very kind of limited kind of scenario. There's only two sides. It's not like the Napoleonic Wars when you have so many countries. Um, it basically has four starting points in this game, which I'll show you right now. Uh, you have... Um, 1861 scenario is the Union, 1861 is the Confederates, 1861 is the Union with the border states aligned with you, and 1860, I think, well actually, sorry, border states aligned with the Confederates, I think, and then 1861 as the Confederates with the border state aligned with the Confederates. Um, I think probably versus the computer, I started uh, the historical scenario as the Union, and I feel like I made it to 1863, and I felt like I was probably going to win, although I don't know. Um, I don't know enough about the victory conditions in the end game to know for sure. So then I started 1861 as the Confederates, and it was tough, <laughs> but it was definitely tough. Um, so now what I think I'm going to do for uh, this game is I'm going to start 1861 Border States as Confederates. Uh, I'm sure once I get used to the game, or I think once I get used to the game, that I can beat this scenario as Confederates, but... As of now, I would say that's really a challenge. And even this, I think, is going to be a challenge, starting with the border states aligned as the Confederates. So let's give that one a try. Um, in the main menu, there aren't really very many options available, so I'm not going to go through those. The tutorials is just a series of YouTube videos. They're not really that good, but they help a little learning the game. There's still some questions I have about how to play the game that were not answered by re looking at the manual and were not answered by the tutorials. Uh, maybe I'll talk about some of those while we play if they come up. Um, so anyway, I'm going to try the Confederates, 1861, as a challenge. Um, I think it'll be a challenge anyway. So here we go. Border states, the Confederacy, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri have all voted to secede, join the other slave states. Can you secure, secure independence for the South with this promising start? Note the capital of the Union has been relocated on an emergency basis to New York City. This fact alone will help persuade Great Britain and France to grant formal recognition to the Confederacy. Further Southern successes will be necessary to obtain that recognition, however. So, three difficulty levels here. Corporal, players receive a moderate damage over their opponent, over the AI in other words. Major, a few advantages are given to the AI for play balancing. General, the AI receives a moderate advantage. Um, I think I'm just going to play it on Major, the middle, give the AI a few advantages, but sounds like not much. I think the main advantage they get is that I get half the number of cards that they get. They get more cards. And the cards are really important. The cards are great in this game. The cards are really helpful. So that's a pretty big advantage, actually. Um, I'm sure once I know how to play the game better, I probably don't need that advantage. Uh, I could even play on a higher difficulty, but right now it's tough. Okay, so it's Confederate turn. Confederates always go first. So we'll take a look at the map here. Um, the interface in the map is slightly clunky. It takes a little bit of time to get used to. Um, but basically, we run from Canada. There's a few Canadian cities up here, Toronto, Montreal, Quebec. And um, you see the north here. So basically, from Washington, D.C., up to Boston on the eastern seaboard. And then um, up to Milwaukee and Chicago, Detroit. Um, the um, Union usually starts with an army in St. Louis. And um, I don't think they start with one in Louisville, but they start with one in Indianapolis that is allowed to rail into Louisville to take it. So Louisville is usually theirs. Um, and then it looks like, oh, it looks like I start with Washington, D.C. That's, this may be too much in my favor now that I look at it. I didn't realize I was going to start with all this. Um, so anyway, uh, then we have the South, all the way into the Deep South. Um, the South has one, two, three, four, five, six ports from Norfolk all the way down to New Orleans. And the Union starts out with some blockading ships. Um, the South can never have Navy like this. Um, all they can build to combat these ships are uh, the ironclads, like the Merrimack. Um, and the North can also build ironclads to protect their blockading Navy. But the, that's all the ironclads really do is fight the Confederate ironclads. The Confederates pay more for 
anything that's kind of like heavy gear so they pay more for their ironclads they pay more for their artillery they pay less for their infantry I think they also pay more for cavalry so pretty much infantry is the only thing the south gets cheap and their infantry is actually less high tech so they have a lot more infantry that comes out random it's randomized but they get more smooth bore muskets instead of rifled um, uh, muskets and um, their artillery is more smooth bore instead of rifled so they kind of have bad technology the south um, but they do get cheap one money cheaper infantry their infantry costs four instead of five for the north but that doesn't mean they're going to have more of it the north seems to always have more of everything um, so anyway uh, the way the naval game works here is the north will deploy its ships to blockade the ports to prevent the confederate ships called blockade runners they don't combat anything all they do is carry goods out so what they, the, the runners do is they start in the ports and then they'll try to escape past the blockade get out to this box, collect cargo in Europe, and then run the blockade back into the port, and it basically gives you money. So actually, it's not collecting cargo, it's selling their cargo. They're probably selling cotton or something. And they bring back money if they can make it back in safely. And every Union ship out here gives a 10% chance to intercept your blockade runners on the way out, and then 10% to intercept them on the way back. So if there's three ships here, 30% chance to sink your blockade runner going out, 30% chance to sink him going in. So as the Confederacy, the only way you can really stop that is to spread out your blockade runners so he has to blockade more ports. And then occasionally you build uh, ironclad and it will go out and fight the um, blockading ships unless they have an ironclad protecting them. And if they do, then there's a battle between the ironclads as the ironclad tries to beat the Union ironclad so that it can kill the ships. And then once the ironclad's out, it can't move. The Confederate ironclads just sit there so what the Union does is musters up two or three of its own ironclads, comes down, destroys it, and now you have to build another ironclad as the South. And ironclads cost a lot. They cost 12. And that's usually a third or more of the, well, maybe a third of the full Confederate income, probably more than a third. Um, you can see the income you get. For example, you get one for Savannah, one for Charleston, one for Wilmington, North Carolina. You don't get much income as the South. Um, we can look at the overall status here. Both sides have a determination level of 100. Um, we can see that the South has eight generals, the North has five. They both have 29 infantry. The South has four cavalry versus three. They both have eight artillery. The North has five warships. The North has two river gunboats. And the role of those is basically to just sail up and down the Mississippi and, a, and, and fire at the fortifications of the Confederate controlled cities. So, like, they can start here at St. Louis and try to reduce the fortification of this city. And you see the fortification. If you click on St. Louis, if I can click on St. Louis. Nope, that's the army. Oops, let me get out of that. Um, there it is. Uh, you can see St. Louis is currently unfortified. There's zero level of fortification there. Um, and by the way, this tells me I get three moves as the Confederates, and I have six rail points remaining. So I could rail six units around. Um, so that's what the the river gunboats do. They just basically sail up and down the Mississippi to bombard fortification levels. Uh, blockade runners, south starts with one. Treasury, the south has 12 money. The north has 22. Monthly revenue, the south gets 12. The north gets 12. Railroad rating, 6 versus 10. Um, European involvement rating is 20. It, the ch basically, the higher it gets, the more chance that Europe might change its status to favor the Confederacy. And I think there are three levels. Basically, they're slightly favoring the Confederacy, then they're really favoring the Confederacy, and then eventually they declare war on the Union, which just means that they might uh, every turn have a chance to sink. They don't really send a big army or anything. Um, every turn they have a chance to sink any Union uh, blockading ships. Not a big chance, but they might sink one. And then after, I think, 10 turns or something, they send a small army into Canada, and it's able to advance from Canada down into, um, I guess, Boston, possibly. Although I'm not sure how well that could work because of the way supply works. You need a railroad to trace supply when you're in enemy territory. Otherwise, you start taking attrition. So I suspect if they actually tried to advance that they might um, just start taking attrition and die. I'm not sure, unless they maybe came... Uh, from Toronto, possibly they could attack directly into Ch Detroit or Buffalo and hurt the Union. I'm not sure. Never had it happen, so I don't know. Um, on the map, you see these little these guys drawn. 
they mean nothing. They're just artwork. Uh, same thing for this camp. It means nothing. All that really means anything is the boundaries between um, territories or, or uh, I don't know what they're called, I guess territories or provinces, um, and the cities. So there's one other feature of the map. If you press the control key, you get a blown up version of this part of the map. And there are some territories showing on the blown up version that you can't see. They don't exist on this big version. So like if you look at Maryland here, it looks like it's just DC plus one more territory. But if you look at the blown up version, it has the Hagerstown territory. It has the Baltimore territory. It has the Baltimore city. It has the Eastern shore of Maryland. It has the Chesapeake shore. It has the Washington DC area. So it's one, two, three, four, five, I think five or six uh, territories plus two cities. And on the big map, it's only one territory and one city. So you really have to blow up the map when you're operating in this area because otherwise you you just can't do anything. I've never even tried to move out of DC without using the blown up map. I don't even know what happens but I suspect you cannot. Um, so the way supply works is very restrictive. You need to have a rail line free of enemy units. If there's any enemy units to block your rail line when you're in enemy territory, you take attrition. In my first game I would play the Union. I advanced from Louisville into Nashville and what happened was a rebel army came out of Chattanooga, advanced into this area, and I wasn't paying that much attention. I expected them to maybe attack me in Nashville, but when they advanced into this area, as you can see, the rail line passes through this area, leaving Nashville. So then I immediately took attrition, and I had a 25, I had a big army, 25 units, and five of them died in one turn, gone from attrition. So it's serious when you get attrition. Um, the biggest army you can have is 20 normally, but the Union gets a card that allows them to go up to 25. And I don't know if the Confederacy ever gets that card, so what my strategy is going to be is the Confederacy is to do something quick to the Union before they get that card that allows an army of 25, because it's very difficult for an army that has max 20 to attack an army that has 25, because that's a lot more troops and they have a lot more staying power in a battle. So. I want to hit the Union before they get their 25 max armies and they get that card drawn. Um, what else can I tell you about the game? Um, the terrain matters when you attack. Um, the terrain on the battlefield is randomized, but I did attack uh, St. Louis once and it had a fortification level of one and the defenders got one fort space that they could take and hold on their side of the board of the battle board which I don't know if that's because the fortification level was one but I suspect it was and it made I think a zero point unit like a sort of green unit which is a zero level and made it into a four which makes it a pretty powerful unit um, and that's another thing you can see like if I look at the army of northern Virginia here well where is my army this is it I guess in DC uh, so this would be the main rebel army confederate army uh, if we look at it you'll see that most of the unit it has two leaders here Beauregard and Johnston rating a six and rating a five um, and then you can see these armies if they have an S in the corner it means they have smooth bore muskets which means they don't shoot very well if it has nothing in the corner of infantry like uh, let me find well there are none it means they have rifled muskets which means they shoot better and then if it has an RR in the corner it means they have repeating rifles which are crazy powerful and the Union gets them by cards. They get these cards that allow them to designate one unit as a repeating rifle unit. Um, and they don't get a lot of them, but I, I think they're very powerful units. And I, currently they won't have any, but they'll get them and they're scary. Um, for artillery, it's the same way. Nothing in the corner means it's a smoothbore artillery. It actually fires better at short range than rifled artillery, but not as good at long range. If it gets an R in the corner, then it's a rifled artillery and it shoots better at long range. Um, so this army has two cavalry. You can see the difference. This guy's a zero, he's green. This guy's a one. And there are times when you lose like a step. So you'll go from level one down to level zero. Like if, if this guy, the Virginia cavalry took attrition, he wouldn't die. He would be reduced from a one to a zero. I think that's my impression from playing the game. Um, in combat, I think it works that way too. I think if you're a one and you take basically a hit, I think you just reduce a level. That's what I think, but I'm not really sure about that. It also, I think, affects how well you fire and how well other units can hit you when they fire at you. I think you're more resilient 
and you also fire better when you're a one instead of when you're a two. So I think all the Union units start out as zeros and the Confederacy starts with a few, I don't know, a slightly experienced or higher morale units that have a one. So they've got a slight advantage in quality in their infantry and cavalry at the beginning. Not a big advantage. It's probably offset by the fact that they have a lot more smoothbore rifles. Uh, the um, smoothbore, uh, but the, the, the um, smoothbores instead of rifles, which the Union starts with, so they don't shoot as well. Um, the Confederacy also seems to get more battle cards that do good in battle, so let's take a look at what cards I started with. It's random. I have reinforcements arrive, which basically means if I have two armies attacking, one with 20 and one with less, and they're either in the same area or adjacent, I can call five units from the nearby army into the battle. So that's pretty good. I have Force March, which lets one army move one extra space. Normally armies only move one space on their turn. This can kind of let you surprise the enemy, maybe surround them to cut off their supply or attack them when they don't expect it, something like that. Uh, new Blockade Runner delivered. You get a free blockade, blockade Runner. Blockade Runners cost, I think, five. So it's like giving you five money, basically. Um, a new general emerges. You get a new general out of your pool. You hope he's Robert E. Lee. I suppose this is how you get Robert E. Lee. I don't know, because I've never had Robert E. Lee. But probably he's one of the random generals in the pool. And if you keep playing this card enough, you can draw it again and play it again. Uh, you might eventually get him. Um, political intrigue destroys a Union general's career. So one random Union general is eliminated. Union has one good leader at the start. Ulysses S. Grant. You hope like crazy that it, when you play this card, it hits Grant. So if that happens, you're so happy as the Confederates. Um, and then there's this card. It basically gives you three options. It can be played as appear on the flank, cavalry behind the lines, or grand battery. I think probably the most effective is this appear behind, appear on their flank, because you don't really have enough cavalry to take good advantage of this. At least I haven't so far as the rebels. And the grand battery, I don't have enough artillery to make this a very good one. So really, this appear on the flank seems good. I've never actually played it in a battle, but it seems like a good battle card. I'm not going to go through all. You can right click to see what it does exactly, but I'll take too much time. I won't go through it. So anyway, this is one that I want to play right now. So I click on it. I get a blockade runner. Um, he's located in the blockade runners area. I don't know where that is actually. He's somewhere. Um, now I will play a new general that emerges, and I'll take a general. I can select an army to put that general in. I should probably look at my armies first before I play that, so I'll cancel that card. Um, looks like I have, let's see what I have. Uh, it's hard, see this is a little, the interface is a little clunky. I tried twice to click on this unit and you see both times I did not succeed in clicking on the unit. So um, maybe it's because I haven't finished playing my card for the blockade runner, I don't know. So let's just get the blockade runners out of the way. I'll, I'll get back to looking at my armies in a minute. So let's skip over to this. If you click on this anchor, you can see you control eight ports. You have one blockade runner in port, one blockade runner waiting, one blockade runner still abroad. Let's try to send ships out. There's one in Charleston I can send out. Actually, why do I have one guy waiting? Ah, okay, I'll send him to Charleston. So I think that's the one I played the card. He has to pick a city to go into. So the one that was waiting is going to run into Charleston. The one that was in Charleston is going to run out. When I click, click accept, these will both be executed. But since there's no Union ships guarding Charleston, it'll be free. No one will get intercepted. The ship will go into Charleston, into port. The other one will run out with goods to sell to Europe. So I'll click accept. Okay, it gives me some warnings. Blockade runner's gone out. It will be back in two to four turns. And then the blockade runner that I played the card from France brought me $4. So he actually brought me some money. And now he's in Charleston. If I click on Charleston, there he is. One blockade runner is in Charleston. Also in Charleston, you see this forge. It basically means I only get three of these as the Confederates. The Union gets four to start with. And the Union can get them quick, get more pretty quickly because you get a card that gives you those as the Union. Uh, I think it's harder for the, US, the Confederates to get that card. I think I. It's just not as often in the deck. There aren't as many of them. Uh, maybe only one of them. So basically, you start out with Charleston as your forge. I think Richmond and maybe uh, I think Atlanta is the other one. So if you lose those, then you have problems because you need the forges to produce any heavy equipment like blockade runners, ironclads, artillery, uh, rail points, anything you want to produce that's not infantry, basically, or cavalry takes a forge point. And the Confederates only start with th three of those. 
Okay, so my my um, ships have been sent out now. That part's done. Now to examine my forces. It looks like I've got three guys with Johnston, who's I think my best commander in New Orleans. So I need to get him railed to somewhere more useful. I've got four guys with Bragg, who is not my best commander in Mobile. I've got an infantry here in Vicksburg. I've got Forrest, who's very good, six leadership. He's in Memphis. And then in St. Louis, just going up the Mississippi here, I have um, Price with a rating of four and five troops. Or, sorry, six troops. Um, and so he's facing a pretty big force in Chicago. Looks like Grant's there with a lot of stuff. Um, and then another uh, similar sized force in Indianapolis, commanded by Buell. Um, looks like it very close to the force that Lyon has in, or sorry, um, that Price has in uh, St. Louis. I don't know where Lyon is. Normally he's one of their leaders. He's a four. Maybe he's in Louisville. Oh no, I'm in Louisville with Polk and another, eh, no cavalry here, so not very balanced force. In Cincinnati, you have McClellan with four infantry and an artillery. Uh, Pittsburgh, they've got an army with banks, no cavalry. Um, up in Philly, you have looks like a big army of 16, so this would be the main Union army with McDowell, who's not a very good commander. They need to replace him. Four artillery and a cav, so that's what's really opposing me here. Um, and let me just make sure there's nothing in, no, nothing in Baltimore. And then coming back down the coast, I've got uh, smoothbore infantry in uh, Norfolk. I've got nothing in Wilmington. I've got in uh, Charleston, Hardy with some troops. Um, and we already looked at Mobile. Mobile. So um, I think the thing to do here, I mean, I'd love to take Chicago because that's one of their main recruiting centers. I don't know if that's realistic, but I could try to build up in St. Louis and march on Chicago. It's not really that far to get there. Um, let's just count it out. So if you're in St. Louis, it would cost one to get into this territory, two to get to this territory, three to get to this territory, four to get into Chicago. So basically four turns. If I advanced there from Louisville, it would take one, two, three, four, five, because I have to go out, which is one, to this province, which is two, this province three, this province four, Chicago five. So it would take longer to get there from Louisville. So it's a shorter track from St. Louis. So I think probably I'll defend at Louisville. Uh, although it's an option to sort of use this central position and threaten either Cincinnati or Indianapolis. But I think if I march out, the other army will come and take Louisville from me. And I don't want to lose Louisville because whoever controls Louisville controls Kentucky recruiting. Whoever controls St. Louis controls Missouri recruiting. Whoever controls Baltimore controls Maryland recruiting. But since these states are already aligned, that's in a, in a normal game. Since in this scenario they're already Confederate states, I guess I just get them unless maybe the Union takes them away. I don't think I have to leave a unit in Louisville, St. Louis, and Baltimore. So I think I'll defend here in Louisville. I might advance out of St. Louis on Chicago. That's one option so that I don't have to rail units in here, kind of concentrate them. I only get six rail points, which really is not much. Um, over here, I could advance, but Pittsburgh could then come and threaten DC. So if we look at Pittsburgh, he could advance one, two, wait, one, two, three, four moves and he's in DC. For me to get to Philly, it takes one, two, three, four, five. So it take me five moves to get to Philly from DC take him four moves to get to Pittsburgh. So if I move out, decent chance the army in Pittsburgh, led by Banks, comes and takes um, DC, which I really don't want to lose. That That's pretty cool that I have DC. Um, okay, so what to do, what to do. I think I'll garrison my ports. Uh, I want to put at least one musket armed infantry in each port. I Ideally, I'd like two. But the Confederate are really short on forces, so I'll probably make do with one because normally the Union just starts with two sea lift. Let's just check it. Um, where is it? Uh, river gunboats, naval forces. I don't know. I think they start with two. I don't know where it says that, though. Probably somewhere. Oh, yeah. 
transport capacity, two transports. So the most they can attack with is two units. I'll have the fortification. I'll be defending. Maybe I can hold the city if I have one. Ideally, I would put two units there, but I really need to build up and take the offensive somewhere. And I can't do that very well if I'm putting two units in each of my six ports. That's 12 units. That's a heck of a lot of units for the Confederates. They don't have that much. So um, you also, by the way, want multiple leaders if you're going into a major battle because you can assign them as core commanders. Um, so let's look. We've got a six, I think, in charge of the army in D.C. Yep, Beauregard and Johnston. Um, we've got a four, I think one single four Polk in charge here and one single four in charge here. So what I'll do is I will send, um, I'll split this army in New Orleans, New Orleans. I'll take Johnson out because I, Johnson, because I want to send him up to St. Louis to take the offensive. I'll also take out the Louisiana artillery and then, um, I think I'll leave it at that for now. So let's take these two units and let's rail them right up to St. Louis. Why don't they rail? Am I not allowed to rail to St. Louis? Oh, I think I can't rail there because this is Union Territory, Illinois. Boy, that's unfortunate. Um, hmm, I could send them to Memphis in March, but that's one, two, three, Four, okay, or Louisville, one, two, three, four. Similar distance from Louisville. Um, I'm kind of tempted to send him to Louisville because then I just got him right on the front line. Yeah, let's send him there, and then I can march him across potentially. Okay, so there's that. Um, what else do we have? We've got Bragg, who's just a terrible leader, um, but he could serve as a core commander. You can have up to three core commanders in a battle with one of the bigger armies. So let's split his force. We will send the experienced Mississippi infantry. Actually, yeah, let's send them and Alabama infantry and Bra or Alabama uh, artillery and Bragg. Um, we'll send those guys somewhere. We'll send them, I think, also up to either Louisville or D.C. I think Louisville, let's try to focus there as soon as we can. Uh, I don't want to fritter things away too much and start to spread my forces out. So then if we look at what's in Charleston, Charleston, um, we can probably send um, Hardy. So let's split that force. I think if I, here's the problem. I, I want to defend these forts. If I don't defend them now, the Union may well just make an immediate invasion. <sighs> it's harder to take it back than it is to hold it because you've got to march across country to get there. So I think the best thing I can do now is just make sure I have these defended. So let me do that. Here is a Mississippi Infantry. I'm going to rail it over to Norfolk. And then I will send one more guy, let's see who. Um, we'll send one infantry from Charleston. Let's split these. Oops, what am I doing here? Split. Let's see, this is the clunkiness of this interface. So select that guy. Aye, aye, aye. So the trick is after you select them, immediately right click, then you can get it. Uh, so we'll send. Let's just send a musket armed infantry. Maybe this one. Or the better one. Uh, no, we'll send this one. And then we'll send it over to uh, Savannah. Okay. So I've got one rail point left. I've got all of my uh, ports, I think, garrisoned at this point. And so now I can probably afford to split this army. Oops. I didn't follow my own advice. Left click, right click. Okay, there we go. We'll send Hardy and we'll also send, I want to say this uh, artillery. Um, we'll send them up to Louisville. Actually, in Louisville, let me try to combine some of these armies together because if you don't, there's too many of them and then it's hard to combine later. So 
I better to do it before I send this guy there. More clunkiness from the interface. So we'll send these over. Let me zoom in. And then I'll combine these together. Okay. Uh, by the way, I don't think it uses their movement to rail. They still have their one move available. Um, I think let's... We've got three operations remaining, three movements remaining. So then the question becomes, with this force, do I want to advance directly on Cincy or Indy? Or do I want to go over, reinforce St. Louis, and advance on the Windy City? Um, this is going to be tough to take any of them because you have to hold your rail line. But I kind of think a decent first move is to take this rail right here. Um, because to go any of those directions, I think I need this space. So let's go ahead and move on out of Louisville to this area. That uses my move. Now next turn, I'll have to make a decision about where to go with this guy. And then um, since I can't rail into St. Louis, I think potentially what I'll do is I'll advance Forest north. I'll just march him all the way up to St. Louis. I need a better commander there anyway. He'll bring the troops with him. Um, okay, so that's one move remaining, and I don't think I really have a, a use for that last move. I think I'm done. Uh, that's it. So we are done with turn one. What am I forgetting? Event cards. Political intrigue. Let's destroy a Union General's career. Maybe I'll get Grant. Let's see. Banks. Eh, didn't really help me much. Banks isn't so good. He's a four, I think. Uh, a new general emerges. Let me play this one. Bring a Confederate general in. Select an army with a Confederate unit. I am, I mean, really only have three choices: the army in D.C., the army here in the central, in the center, or the army over here. Since I've already got Forrest, who's a six, headed here, and I've already got, I think, a six here. I think I'm going to put him with this army, even though I have Johnston here. I would, if he's a great leader. I'll move another leader away and um, let him command this army or assist with this army. So I think let's try that. Nope, I got Buckner. Um, so with Buckner, nothing fantastic here. Um, army of Northern Virginia could probably use another corps commander. Let's just check. They've only got two leaders. So yeah, let's take Buckner. We will move him back into Louisville. Uh, why can't, oh, let me split it. That's why I can't move it. So now I've got him split. I'll grab Buckner, move him into Louisville. And then I'd love to rail him, but I think he can't rail until next. Oh no, he can rail, super. Okay, so I railed him to Northern Virginia. Try to merge him with this army. Done. All right, now do I have any more event cards? Nope, these are all sort of battle or rare occasion kind of cards. I don't want to play them now. So I will end this turn. May 1861 done. Let's see what happens. I get to choose a card. I can relieve a Union General of Command after a victory. So this looks like a way to get rid of Grant. Um, or I can do Lone Star State. Maybe play to Vicksburg. It's controlled by Confederacy. One free infantry unit and one free cab appear in East Texas, which must not be. Um, I really would love the troops, but I would love the chance to get rid of Grant. So that's a tough call. This unit, I'm, this card I'm gonna have to probably sit on for a while. It probably, I mean, it'll probably be a while until I beat the army with Grant. Although who knows, could happen quickly. Um, this, I could start moving these units to the front right away where I need them. So I'm probably more inclined to play this um, I don't know. I think I'm going to take this card. I can play it next turn and get some units in Texas. Union played, a new general emerges. So they got a, a general in Philly. Appeal to the governor of New York. They'll get two units in New York. King Corn, they reduce European involvement from, it was 20, I think. Now it's down to 10. Union gunboats attacking Memphis. They failed to reduce it. I'm surprised they weren't attacking St. Louis. Let's see what they do here. Oh, they're gonna invade me. 
So here they come. What are they attacking? Region of Savannah. So I have one infantry. They have two infantry. Commanded by Thomas Five. That's a good leader. Um, uh, since I ha I'll start, I'll defend with a generic leader who's going to have a two value. So I'll be out generaled and outnumbered. I'm going to go ahead and defend the region. I maybe I can drive them back. Let's see. Okay, so this is the minor battle uh, battlefield. I can defend in the forest, which is good, but I can defend in the city, which is better. So I'll go to the city. Uh, looks like he's also got two smoothbore infantry, so all of us are using smoothbores. The city makes me into a two instead of a zero, so maybe I'll have a chance. Let's see. Fight the next round. See who goes first. I think I get to go first. So the bad part here is once you fire, you become more vulnerable to enemy fire. But they could fire at me and rout me or eliminate me or disrupt me so I'm gonna go ahead and take my shot uh, both of these are average attacks I have better quality that's why I have the plus plus they have a better commanding general they get a minus I have an average attack with a value of zero so not a great chance but I might do something let's take a shot looks like I missed they're firing at me they eliminated me they'll take the city too bad that's really bad luck actually eliminated me on the first shot that's a a very good result for them so I took one loss they took none I'm losing <laughs> the game's lost that was really not a good result now I have to go dig them out of Savannah which is gonna take a lot of marching and maneuvering to get there because I can't rail there anymore yeah that was a really bad luck result in that battle I really didn't expect that to go that quickly and with me my elimination instead of just retreating looks like they're railing a leader over to Cincy and they moved out of Cincinnati so I guess they're coming to face me Sherman's March to the Sea may be played after occupying any Confederate city in the Deep South. Oh, interesting. Since they took Savannah, it must be played on the same turn as the city's capture. The Confederacy Treasury loses Confederate Treasury loses ten dollars multiplied by the income rating of the city. Well, thank goodness, I think it's a city rating of one, so it should just be ten dollars lost. Ouch, that really hurts. And now there's a random chance that all cities get a fortification increase every turn, so. Cities are kind of fortifying. It happens slowly. I think 10% chance. Okay, so here's the production area. I've only got 18 money since I lost 10. I've got limits on what I can build. Four heavy equipment, basically. An ironclad counts as two. Six cavalry. I'm not going to have money to build all this stuff anyway. I'm tempted to build an ironclad. Let's just take a look at what this would mean. So what could happen is I could put them in any of these cities. Since it says 10%, each of these cities is defended by one or blockaded by one Union ship. So, or in the game, it's a ship. I don't know what it is in real life. It might be a squadron of three ships or eight ships. But anyway, each is defended by one. So if I build the ironclad, it'll go out and it might sink that one ship. However, since it's only one ship defending each or blockading each, I'm inclined to wait to get maybe two or three and to have a chance to destroy more with the $12 that I spend. Because once I spend the 12, the ironclad, my ironclad is never going to move. It's going to sit there, and the union is going to build a bunch of ironclads and come and destroy it. So I'm, I'm going to save my money for now. But I think I will build one or more blockade runners because they'll get me money over time. Hopefully, they'll more than pay the back the investment. Um, so I can't send them to Savannah because the union hold that city. I'll send one to, let's say... Um, New Orleans and then I will build maybe another one and I'll send it to let's say DC because I don't expect to lose that anytime soon I I'm almost tempted to build another one but I think instead what I'll do here is get a couple of infantry since they cost four that'll put me down to zero money I'll say accept there's my new units one's in Vicksburg one blockade runner added there one in DC. I should have one more new unit coming. I don't know where it went. Of course, the Union is getting a bunch of stuff. It's my turn. Okay. 
Um, so I need to dig these guys out of Savannah, unfortunately. I will need a leader for that. So let's zoom in here, see what we have. No leaders. Um, check my troops in Texas. Oh, I got to play my Texas card. So let's play that one. Lone Star State. All right. So here's my troops in Texas. They've got to march across. Um, there's no rail line in Texas. Let me just kind of, I guess, get them moving. I think the quickest way to get somewhere is to get to Vicksburg and then rail. So they'll, they'll head toward Vicksburg. That's one of my activations done. I'm down to three. Um, now I need to find a leader somewhere and send him to command the assault on Savannah. It's not going to be Forrest. He's going to keep marching this way. So I'll go ahead and march him. Um, I'll probably take a guy out of DC. So let's, let's look at the army here. Buckner, who just went in there, might be a good choice, I think. So yeah, let's send Buckner. So we'll split this army. And we will send Buckner. I don't really think I need to send any troops. Um, I should be able to muster some troops from down there, probably. Let's just look around and make sure. Um, what do I have here? I've got one smooth bore. I actually am going to leave two smooth bores, I think in um, Charleston so I will actually I'll leave this south kit no I'll leave this guy I'll leave this smooth board. I'll separate him and then I'll combine him with the other smooth board. now I'll leave these two guys to defend Charleston because Charleston I think is a city with a forge and I don't want to lose it yep it's got a forge so I don't want to lose that one um, next I want to get some more units in here because I think the best place to get to Savannah is from Charleston because that would cost me one, two, three. From Atlanta, it would cost me four to get to Charleston. So I think I want to muster my units here. So let's bring... Um, let's go ahead and bring the leader, Buckner, down to Charleston. And we will try to merge him with this one infantry that's here. So that's the start of his army. Um, now we have to figure out what else we can send with him. This unit out of Vicksburg is a likely candidate, so let's send him over. Charleston. Then we will try to merge him into the... Oh, looks like he didn't merge. So let's take him. He's here. Merge him in. All right, so now we've got Buckner with two troops. And then um, next, we have to get him some more troops. I could wait for the Texas troops, but I don't really want to do that. I don't really think he's going to march on DC immediately. Uh, his army looks smaller. He's only got 11 there, 5 there. He'd need to combine them. So I think it's safe to send some units out of DC. So I'll right click on that, split it. Um, question is, do I want to send an artillery or a cavalry? Um, I don't know. I think three artillery is kind of the bare minimum here, so let's not send them. Let's send some of these smoothbore muskets and try to level them up. Taking Savannah back. So we take these two, rail them down to Charleston. Then we'll combine them with um, Buckner's force. So now he's got four infantry. I have more real moves if I want to send more. I think I actually will send more. Let's send another unit. I know I'm doing this piecemeal, but it's okay. I'm going to go ahead and send an artillery down. We will combine them. Now he's got five units. I feel like that's enough. That better be enough, hopefully. Uh, let's march on out. So we'll march into this territory. Okay, now I'm down to one activation, but I don't think I'm ever going to use it. The only other thing I might do is rail a second unit into Wilmington and Norfolk to defend them. It's actually not a bad idea. Um, although I 
don't think he's going to come directly with another invasion. He could. I would have to loosen or weaken my army in DC though. I think I'll go ahead and send one unit out. Let's send the um, let's send one with some experience here, the North Carolina smoothbore infantry. And where do we want to send them? Let's go to I want to say Wilmington instead of Norfolk. Um, no, Norfolk, it's it's farther to march to take back Norfolk, so let's go to Norfolk. Oops, clicked on the unit instead of clicking on the territory. That's the kind of thing that happens with this interface. It's a little bit clunky clunky. Okay, so we have two units there now. Nothing else really to do other than decide what to do with my army that was marching to take one of these cities. So I feel like this unit is headed over to meet me. So I'm tempted to just stay there and defend. Um... If I march north to Indiana, actually, I don't think he can attack me if I stay here in one turn. So I think if I march outside of Indiana, he could go one to here and one into Louisville. If I go here, so then he goes to here, Eastern Kentucky or North Kentucky. And then I would respond by going back here, and then he would respond. So I think he could take the city from me if I move any farther north. So I think I'll just sit there. Uh, I really need more troops. I need kind of a second army, ideally, to defend Louisville. So I don't think I'm going to move him right now. Let's just uh, look at our blockade runners. I don't think I did that yet. Let's try to run some blockade runners out. Um, Port of Origin. So they're in DC, which is 10% blockaded, so I'll accept that. They're in New Orleans, so I'll move the guy out of New Orleans. And the last one's in Charleston, so I'll move him out of Charleston. And then there's one wait, waiting abroad, or he's still abroad, but he's not waiting, so he's still trying to sell his cargo. I can't do anything with him. So I'll click accept. Blockade runners made it out. Blockade runners made it out. And I lost the blockade runner. Darn. So that that hurts. Okay. Um, so I think that's it for the turn. I've done my navy. I've done my event cards. Yep. And I've moved everything I want to move. So we'll end the turn. Let's see what the union does. June 1861. This will conclude the turn, by the way. Income tax. They got thirty dollars. Wow, that's a lot of money. She was Union gumboats attacking Memphis. Reduced it to zero. The monitor. The um, ironclads went to Norfolk. So those two will defend that ship there now. They attacked the fortifications of the port, but didn't do anything. Preparing to move by sea. Oh, they left. They went back to Philly. So that means it should be easy to retake my city, at least. I hope. In fact, I think I might be able to rail in there now. Because the Union, I think, only holds it when they actually leave units there. So I think it's actually a free city. I mean, it's a mine again, basically. But I have to send units there to defend it. The Union looks like they're building up a bigger force for Grant. Wow, he's got 15 units now. That's a big army. 16 units. No, 15 still. He took another leader there. And he's merged his forces outside of Indiana Indianapolis. And that's funny. He moved that army into northern Pennsylvania from Pittsburgh. I'm not sure I understand what's going on there. Okay, looks like we are at July of 1861. I'll stop the recording here and uh, play some more next time. Thank you.